Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. I'm Captain Helen Park, and I'm a project manager in the space portfolio at the Defense Innovation Unit. As an active duty Air Force captain serving as a liaison from the Space and Missile Systems Center, it's my pleasure to welcome you today for a fireside chat about the next five years of defense innovation, featuring our director, Mike Brown, and Vice Chief of the Joint Chief of Staff, General John Hyden. We are very excited about today's discussion as it also kicks off DIU celebration of our fifth anniversary. And Mike will take the stage in a moment with a little bit of DIU history. Thank you again for joining us. And with that, I'd like to introduce Mike Brown, director of DIU to give opening remarks. Mike, the floor is yours. Thanks, Helen. Under Secretary of Defense Ash Carter, DIU-X opened its doors in Silicon Valley five years ago last month as an experiment to lead DOD outreach to commercial innovators. Today, DIU is the only joint DOD organization focused exclusively on fielding and scaling commercial technology across the military. Our mission is threefold. First, accelerate the adoption of commercial technology into the military. Second, transform the military's capabilities. And third, strengthen the national security innovation base as called for in the National Defense Strategy. The IU has five uh, commercial technology areas, AIML, autonomy, cyber, human systems, and space. And on October 1st, we'll be launching our sixth portfolio in advanced energy and materials. With offices in Silicon Valley, Boston, Austin, and the Pentagon, the IU connects its DOD partners uh, with America's leading technology companies to solve problems as varied as predictive maintenance for aircraft and ground-based vehicles, to providing cyber-hardened U.S. source small drones, not only across DOD, but across the federal government. We have initiated almost 100 projects since our inception. That's triple today what we were doing two years ago and fielded now dozens of solutions to warfighters, influencing about $600 million worth of DOD procurement. Today, we're delighted to welcome General John Hyten to speak to us about how the Defense Department is innovating in this renewed era of great power competition. General Hyten is the 11th chairman, Vice Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and previously he served as the Director of Space Forces for Operations Enduring Freedom and Iraqi Freedom. He has been Commander of the Air Force Space Command and his job immediately preceding us, the Commander of U.S. Strategic Command. General Hyten, welcome and thanks for being with us today. Thanks very much, Mike. It is a pleasure to be here today. We're excited about uh, the conversation with you today and we'd like to just start with just telling us a little bit about your role as the uh, Vice Chairman of the Joint Chiefs and how that role is influential in DOD's adoption of new technology. What I thought uh, I was going to be doing when I became the Vice Chairman last November and what I ended up doing uh, in great part is not what I expected. Uh, and it's really, you can you know blame a lot of things on COVID, but you can blame COVID on that as well because... Uh, when I became co-chair of the duty task force with the deputy secretary of defense, uh, that began consuming all of my time. Uh, you know, one of the interesting things about being a combatant commander, when you're a combatant commander and you hear 2030, that means 830 tonight. Uh, that's where your focus has to be. Uh, I really felt like when I became the vice chairman, uh, when I heard 2030, it would be the year 2030. And what is the joint force going to look like in 2030? And how do I work with uh, DIU and R&E and the services in order to uh, uh, basically, basically restructure the joint force to deal with the challenges that are going to be 2030. That was my expectations, but it's been difficult. I mean, it's been difficult just finding time to talk to, talk with you, to email you, uh, to talk mm -hmm. with R&E. Uh, and Mike Griffin was a good friend of mine, but uh, our our contacts were few and far between as we went through COVID. Now that we start to begin to normalize it, I'm starting to jump back into looking more at the future. And the first thing that's coming uh, along when we define 2030 is the joint warfighting concept. And many of the technologies that you're working in DIU will be part of the joint warfighting concept. Uh, we'll have supporting concepts, uh, concepts underneath those. And the supporting concepts will be 
uh, joint all domain command and control, information advantage, which uh, requires artificial intelligence and, and new ways of doing uh, data management and software. Uh, it, it talks about uh, new joint fires, uh, integrating all the domains, including space and cyber, to make sure we have an effective. So when you look at the new joint warfighting concept, it's about integrating all the domains across time and space. Uh, so there's no more lines in time or geography on the battlefield, and we can move at pace to deal with the threats that uh, we are going to face as we approach 2030. Uh, so we're starting to walk into that uh, new world right now. I'm starting to uh, make more time and find more time to deal with that. And we're starting to gain momentum again on the joint warfighting concept, which to be honest, as we went through the spring, uh, that work was really held in abeyance. We were gonna have a, a big uh, a global war game. That war game is actually starting tomorrow now. Uh, uh, you know, so it's three or four months after we wanted it to, but we're really starting to move with uh, a critical pace, uh, which is necessary because the biggest challenge we have is um, our department has become expert at moving slow uh, and we have to figure out how to move fast again. Uh, that's where folks like DIU uh, can really help out by leveraging people that know how to move fast. So I'll stop there because I could go on for that forever, but uh, it's uh, been an interesting year, that's for sure. I'll be glad when 2020 is gone and I don't know if I mentioned it, but I hate COVID. <laughs> I think we, we all do, we've all had our fill of these virtual events and uh, looking forward to getting back to being with folks live. Uh, well, thanks for mentioning uh, that EIU will play a role in the evolution of technology. You, you've had quite a bit of experience now with EIU, especially through your experience with our space portfolio. And then uh, we met when you were heading up uh, uh, US Stratcom. I think it'd be helpful just to get your assessment of DIU's uh, evolution and value to the department. Uh, just your perspective on what would have been the good and the bad. And, and Looks like we've lost your, there we go. My back? You're back. Okay, so I think you described the good when you, uh, when you talked about uh, the mission of DIU. Uh, and, uh, and the good is reaching out to the commercial sector that in many ways, this department has not been able to leverage as we've gone through time. Uh, we have great working relationships with our traditional defense contractors that we've developed over the years. Um, but the big innovation in this country over the last decade plus has been out of a different sector of our, our economic power. It's been out of the places where you are. It's been out of uh, Silicon Valley, out of Boston, out of Cambridge, out of Austin, uh, out of different elements in Washington besides the Pentagon. That's where the innovation has come from. And we have to figure out a way to leverage that innovation. Uh, that's the strength uh, of DIU, and DIU has been very effective in that. The weakness of DIU uh, is, is the challenge of moving from a group of people that the Department of Defense is not used to dealing business with into main programs of record deliver the, that deliver real capabilities uh, when the machine likes to go the other direction. The machine likes to go to big traditional programs that deliver uh, big bang uh, you know, deliveries in a decade or a decade plus, and they don't like to move fast. Uh, well, we, we have uh, competitors now and we have potential adversaries that are moving really fast and we have to figure out how to move ahead. And so the industries that you deal with know how to move fast. We have to move that into the department and we've been less successful on moving that into the department. It's been like, pulling teeth many, many ways to, to move things in because it's not the traditional way of doing business. So we have to figure out how to do that better. And then the, the last thing that DIU is not good at, which is not the DIU mission, by the way, it's really the department's mission, is I'll say the next great invention. Uh, the next great invention comes from applying technology to a new way of warfighting. Uh, it's... Uh, it's the integrated circuit. It's the uh, it's GPS uh, that fundamentally changes how we fight wars uh, and how we basically operate every weapon system that we have in, in the inventory, not just because of navigation, but because of the timing. Uh, th that didn't come from just a commercial technology. That came from taking a technology and developing an application. So we have to figure out how to apply the applications of these technologies too. That will help us cross this stream that's difficult to cross into the programs of record. Because when you come up with something, 
uh, that fundamentally changes warfare for the better, then the department eventually gets around to supporting it. Although I remember that my service killed GPS in the budget like five times before we actually supported it. So it's always going to be a challenge. And those are the challenges that we have to work together to figure out how to cross. It sounds like um, one of the areas that uh, would be beneficial is thinking of other streams of adopting innovation. You mentioned uh, programs of record and sometimes there's friction there. You envision that there might be some alternatives to programs of record to getting uh, concepts fielded, and and I think Congress. I want to want to hear that answer, and then I want to talk about Congress's role in this because they like to make sure that we've uh, laid out exactly our plans two years in advance. But maybe first on uh, are there alternatives to programs of record to get technology fielded? And there are, and so the. Uh, you know, the, the, the challenge from moving from research and development into programs of record is, has been around a long time. Uh, it's, it's called the valley of death, is that you, you just can't make that uh, leap across from research into real programs. It's so difficult to move from, uh, from basic science into applied science into actual programs of record in the end game to do that. That's been around a long time. Uh, but the way we structured it in the path was, we had our own defense laboratories, uh, whether it was the Naval Research Laboratory or the Air Force Research Laboratory or, or where, wherever it was and whatever service that we're talking about uh, that would come up with that. And then the services would take those technologies that came out of their laboratories and move them forward across. And it was the services responsibility to move them forward. That's how it was done. And, and as difficult as it was, at least uh, the services owned the laboratories where the research was happening, and they knew the research was there, and they were the responsible ones for moving it across. Uh, the great inventions in America uh, will still, some of them come from the service laboratories, but the vast majority will come from the commercial sector. Uh, and uh, I was talking to a, uh, uh, a company on the West Coast, I'll just keep it very broad, uh, uh, because of obvious reasons when I tell the story uh, about how much they were investing. And, it, and it's not one of the, the giant companies that uh, just leap to your mind when you think about uh, 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 network uh, capabilities and artificial intelligence. Uh, but I asked them how much they spent every year on research and development. And the answer was $5 billion. One company, $5 billion. And if you look at across the enterprise, there's going to be tens of billions, maybe in the hundreds of billions of dollars that the commercial sector is investing because that's their lifeblood. The ones that figure that out are going to be the critical leaders of, uh, of our, our nation and the most valuable companies in the world. And so that's, that dwarfs the amount of money that we're investing uh, in these kind of technologies. Uh, if you look at the amount of money we're investing in the Jake, and it's hundreds of millions of dollars. That's a lot of taxpayer dollars going at that. That's important. But hundreds of millions of dollars is dwarfed compared to tens of billions or hundreds of billions of dollars. And so we've got to figure out a way, a different way, to move things from that sector into the execution phase. Uh, because the services don't own that commercial sector. That's why DIU was formed. That's why Secretary Carter put DIUX out first in Silicon Valley and then in Cambridge to figure out how to reach into that, to find ways to bring that into the department. But we have to have some place that, that is, is the place where applications are thought of. Um, it's not just the technology, but the applications. And it's very difficult for the DIU staff to be the ones responsible for that application side. That usually comes out of the services, maybe the joint force, maybe DOD, but mostly the services. And so there's got to be a path from DIU into the services when you talk about applications. And it's gotta be different than the way we do it today. And how about the role of Congress? I think one of the uh, obstacles that we've observed of scaling innovation is the fact that when you didn't have great, uh, great power competition and we could take our time, uh, the two year cycle from planning something to putting that in the president's budget to Congress reviewing it, maybe wasn't such an inhibitor but that is a big inhibitor today. Uh, so you probably have some thoughts about how we could be working better as a department with Congress to speed up that process. So um, the one thing I, I've learned about dealing with Congress, especially for the last uh, 10 or 15 years, 
uh, as a general officer, when I've dealt with Congress pretty directly, is that uh, Congress will give us a certain period of time to figure it out ourselves by asking us the basic question, how do you want to do it? And it's up to us to come up with a good answer and tell Congress how I want to do that. And then if we need laws, Congress will pass laws and it will enable us to do that. But I've also learned if we don't answer that question, Congress will write it themselves. Uh, and they will force us down that path. You can go all the way back to Goldwater Nichols to, to, to watch that. Congress had asked us for year after year after year before Goldwater Nichols to figure out how we do, should do um, uh, joint operations and, and joint training, all those things that had been asked year after year. And finally, they said, we'll write it ourselves. And they did. Uh, and it worked pretty well, despite huge opposition from the uniformed military. So sometimes Congress has to force us down that path. But it's always better if we answer it ourselves and then work hand in hand with Congress to define what that should be. Uh, I would like to think that we can do that as we go forward here because that's the fastest way to go through. And you mentioned the fundamental problem. The fundamental problem is speed. Uh, because when you have somebody like China that is going extraordinarily fast, that doesn't have a two-year decision cycle, they have a two-minute decision cycle in many cases, um, you're... You, you run the risk in the long term of losing that competition. Now, as we sit here today, uh, we're still well ahead in the competition, but we're ahead in the competition because of our past and not because of our future. We have to make sure we structure the future to allow us to maintain that advantage as we go forward. And that's going to be challenging because we just, we like to move slow. And it's worth a second for just me to describe why that is, because it's actually not evil intent that we have become slow and deliberate. Uh, when we became the most powerful military in the world, and there was no significant competitor that, that could match us, the focal point for the departments was, well, let's make sure that every decision we make is the most efficient, effective decision we can. In order to do that, you set up a structure to make sure you don't make mistakes. And that's the structure we have today. It's a structure of a, a leader. And you can go on the corporate side and find many, many examples mm -hmm. of that. Uh, and That's right. I'll say IBM, Kodak, where you're this, this leader, but you develop uh, a love of the status quo and a aversion to taking risks and moving in different directions. Uh, and when you do that, you put yourself at risk of losing the competition. So we have got to move ahead quickly and adjust that and understand how to take risk again, strategic risk. Uh, and we actually know how to do that, but uh, in many ways, we're just, we kind of forgot. Uh, so we have to just go back and reestablish that ability to take risk and move quickly. If we do that, then you can take the capabilities that are out there. And if you look at AI or space or cyber or any of the big five that, that you have, they all lend themselves that model really well. Yes, speed is really one of the most important uh, features of DIU. So we always measure ourselves on how fast can we get a company on contract, and we aspire to do that in 60 to 90 days. And how fast can we get capability fielded? And that tries to match the commercial sector, as, as you point out. What are some of the thoughts that you have about how we can change the uh, Pentagon culture, DOD's culture, to start moving at their required speed again. As you say, we've done it before, so it's just, just a muscle memory we've, we've lost a bit of practice with. So there's a million answers to that question, so I'll just pick two. Uh, so um, number one, uh, we have to remember again to empower the people that actually do the work. Um, so I don't know if I've told this, this story to you before. I, probably many in the audience have heard it, but I'll repeat it again because it's worth saying. And that is uh, when I was a young officer, a captain in Los Angeles, uh, where uh, Captain Park is right now, uh, I, was, uh, I was assigned in a program office, and the person I wanted to grow up to be was the colonel program directors that work in Los Angeles. Uh, I didn't want to be a general, for gosh sakes. That was like death. Uh, I wanted to be the Colonel Program Director. Why did I want to be the Colonel Program Director? Because they had all the money and resources and the authority to make decisions. 
they were given all the authority to make decisions and, and they were able to take that money and move it in interesting ways and move unbelievably fast. And oh, by the way, yes, there were uh, failures. And when failures happened, people were removed. Uh, and But I also remember there's like 10 colonels lined up to get the next job because give me the authority and money and I will make it happen. That kind of, uh, of authority, responsibility and money is essential to moving fast. Uh, but over the years, rather than running programs out of Los Angeles or Dayton or Aberdeen or wherever uh, a military program director or program manager was, um, we moved all the authorities for spending money, all the authorities for making decisions back to the Pentagon and put them in many places in committees in the Pentagon. And so program directors, rather than working with their contract to deliver a capability, would spend uh, most of their time trying to get something through this building. So I've, I've told Congress, I've told my bosses, it's a real simple metric to figure out when you flip that back on its side, because con with the help of Congress and with the help of, uh, of Secretary Lord and ANS, uh, we're moving authorities back to the services and the services are slowly moving things back to the field. And I just tell them, just go, go take a program director's calendar, add up the number of days the program director is in the contractor plant that's building something and the number of days they're in the Pentagon. And when it flips and they're in the contractor's plant more than they're in the Pentagon, you'll know you have adjusted the risk portfolio and pushed things back out to the field. So we've made great progress the last two years, uh, but I bet you if, you if you do that study, people are still spending more time in the Pentagon than they are in the field. Uh, and that, that will be the challenge because stuff gets feel, uh, built in the contractor plant. It does not get built in the Pentagon. You always have to remember that. Uh, I think somehow we forget it. The second example I'll get you is in software. Uh, so you work uh, in the middle of some of the most innovative software companies in the world. Just what they do in software is amazing. Um, we have not been able to bring that method of software development into the department yet. Uh, we talk about agile software development and we talk about DevOps models. And so we understand conceptually what it is right now. But when I walk into most of the defense contractors plants, I still find multi hundred person software development teams developing this this massive million line of code software development and the integration between that many software developers is almost impossible to manage. And all of the, uh, the software development companies in California, in Cambridge, uh, in Austin, they all understand that. So you never see 500 person software development teams. That's just, you see small teams. And then the, the challenge is integrating the small teams together in order to deliver a product. So, I think we're starting to make that change, but we haven't fully made it yet. Uh, we're saying the right terms. We're pushing those things out onto contracts. I think an a ANS is doing a good job. r &E is doing a good job. Uh, you do that every day, but we have to continue to go down that path because until we change our success rate in delivering software, we're not going to be able to move fast. So I'll stop yeah, there. Uh, well, uh, great examples. The first one, a lot about incentives, uh, how we allocate our time, and of course, the second one, more, more agile methods, which is small teams have been proven to be so much more productive. So, and I think that uh, extends well beyond software. Let's, let's talk about uh, some of the important DOD priorities uh, over the next five years uh, and the role, increasing role we believe technology will play. Uh, you started talking about that earlier when we talked about this new warfighting concept that brings communications, command, and control together. But there's probably others on your mind. So when I look at where the department's going, um, you know, the, there's a number of terms that you can um, use to talk about it. Uh, you could say it's all about the data, and you'd be correct. You could say it's all about the network, and you'd be correct. Uh, it's all about information. You'd be correct. Uh, the key is figuring out how to really uh, change how we fight, how we command and control, and those, cap and those capabilities are going to be completely different a decade from now. And uh, the joint program that we're pressing to do that is joint all-domain command and control. Uh, that is uh, what we're tying all those pieces to. And uh, 
And when you see it in action in little ways, and the Air Force has done a, a couple of what I think, you know, for the department's perspective are large uh, um, um, examples. Uh, from the rest of the world's perspective, they're kind of small examples, and they're they're actually pretty straightforward. All they do is they they make all of the information that comes off every sensor available to everybody that needs it. And because of that, every shooter has information to acquire targets. So you see uh, an artillery piece shoot down a cruise missile. How, how is that even possible? It's possible because everybody has exquisite information. And then you have to figure out how do you operate with exquisite information everywhere and then degrade that as the information is taken away. So it becomes all about data and all about the network and all about information and all about operating in a full up network environment and a degraded network environment because you have to be able to do both. So the challenge is this new demand, uh, command and control structure. And so the, the joint warfighting concept is the concept that pulls all of these pieces together. And uh, so the secretary has challenged me uh, multiple times uh, pretty directly uh, because the words that we've been using to describe it have not been adequate. So uh, we've been putting a lot of thought to it and we're getting a little bit better, um, but we're not all the way there yet. We actually don't know how to phrase the construct, but the, the biggest difference in a warfighting concept in 2030 versus today is the elimination of lines on the battlefield. And lines on the battlefield come in multiple perspectives. They come in with fire support coordination lines that say, okay, you can operate up to here, but you can't operate over here. And you say, okay, Army only here, Air Force here. Or you define uh, a kill box, which means, okay, you, Airplane 1, can operate in this kill box. You, Airplane 2, can operate in this, but never cross the streams. Um, and then all of that is time sequence. So you can be in this area for a certain period of time and then this area for a certain period of time. So you, you have these geographical boundaries and these time boundaries that define everything that you do. But the future joint warfighting concept, if you can make this information available across, across the entire joint force, the future concept is those lines disappear. The lines of time and the lines of geography disappear, which means an army unit can defend itself with a platform or they can strike deep at an enemy with a platform or an air force unit can do the same thing or a navy unit can do the same thing and and now the adversary instead of worrying about that one capability that's in this one area has to worry about everything coming from everywhere simultaneously and as soon as that happens then the advantages that we will glean from that are huge now there's lots of challenges with doing that challenges of operating Again, fully network and then with a degraded network. Uh, the operator of moving data around so that, uh, that everybody has the right data, but not all the data. Uh, because if you want to feed all the data to everybody all the time, it's an, it's an infinite problem and you can't get there from here. So how do you decide who gets what where and move those pieces around? Uh, but again, this, these are the fundamental changes that will happen. And it, it comes leveraging software, agile software, uh, data and data management, artificial intelligence to make sure we understand how to push things in the right place at the right time, where to react, uh, and and obviously the, the command and control systems that we use. Uh, but it's interesting because people have come to me over the years when we talk about a new command and control structure, and they all want to present to me the, the common operational picture that shows me everything. Um, I don't really care about that. I actually don't care about it at all. I want to know where the data is and how you decide what data gets pushed and what data gets pulled and how do I pull the data I need in order to do my job and to create that common sight picture as we go through that. That's how you actually get to global integration, not through a bunch of, okay, now you're the global integrator, figure out how to integrate everybody else. No, you integrate globally because everybody has the ability to acquire the right information. I'll stop there. Well, so... Uh a fascinating concept and you can see the appeal of needing to get there. I'd like to hear your perspective on the role of commercial technology in that concept, because you could say the old way of doing things might be have a competition, award that to one of our defense prime, ask them to give us the system. But we know that uh, who, who has worked harder at the integration and uh, making sure that there are standards so that uh, there's interoperability 
uh, when we want to work in a large system like that, that's the commercial sector. So just interested in your perspective on how uh, how you think about the commercial sector's role in developing that a JADC2 concept. So, Paul, you can go down um, a bunch of different paths similar to the last question. So um, uh, let me just hit a couple. Um, it may be two or three, depending on how long it takes me to go through the first couple. Um, sure. But let's just talk about sensors first. Uh, sensors become critical. Uh, and it's not just exquisite sensors that see things, um, you know, from time to time. It's the ubiquitous sensors that have persistence across the entire battle space that are going to be critical. And if you look at what is being developed uh, in our country today and with our allies in particular, and if you look at what some of our potential adversaries are looking at too, you see these uh, distributed constellations of fairly simple uh, sensors that actually see the ground quite well and provide persistence over an area with uh, with almost uh, an unblinking eye. That's the, the concept for the future. When you have that kind of sensor capabilities, uh, now you can see what you need to see in order to um, make decisions and move quickly in an all-domain command and control process. But only if you can take all that information and move it to the right place at the right time so that the right person sees it and the people that don't need it don't have to run through all the clutter to get to what they need. Uh, so that, that's kind of the first piece. That central grid is coming a lot from a commercial architecture, not from a defense architecture. And, th and then if you see about, okay, now I have to distribute it uh, and get the information in the right place, how I'm going to do that? Uh, I would say that if you try to do that with, with um, uh, typical um, decision algorithms, that if you're an engineer, you've my age, I'll, I'll put it that way, not a young engineer, but if you're an engineer my age, those are decision algorithms that come up with simple answers one at a time. And and the, if you think about the massive amounts of data that you have to, to, to process, you'll never get there from here. So you're going to have to use artificial intelligence algorithm and machine learning to allow you to figure out how to pull the right information, how to get the right information, and make decisions on that uh, to support the warfighter in doing the job that they have to have. Now, the Jake has got that kind of overarching responsibility, but most of the artificial intelligent work is actually being done in the commercial sector and not in the Jake. Uh, the Jake is kind of reaching out to the commercial se sector and trying to leverage that, just like DIU is. So mm -hmm. we have to figure out how to leverage those pieces so you can put all of that sensor information in a single place uh, which is everywhere. It's in a cloud architecture, not in a single data server, uh, but it's in a cloud architecture and reach in and pull all of those pieces out. That is a, a huge challenge for the department, but can only be done with uh, technology that is mostly being developed on the uh, commercial side. And then to emphasize the point I made uh, in the, uh, a couple of questions ago, uh, you can't do that with software that's delivered every five years. Uh, the software that you need to do that is going to be delivered maybe daily, uh, and it's going to change all the time. You know, daily software drops are going to be critical uh, as, as we go forward. And the ability of our traditional approach to software management to deal with daily software drops is almost impossible. But that's the way the commercial sector is. The commercial sector is delivering new uh, software all the time in a seamless way so the customers don't even see it. That's what we have to move to. So I'll just stop on those three issues because they link together, but uh, you can you can go a number of different ways uh, in answering that question. Yeah, it's, it's interesting that in the consumer world, we're used to that automatic updates much more so than what we find in the military. That's happening to our, uh, our phones, our watches, uh, you know, sometimes even more frequently in the day. So. Well, I'll tell you another interesting story that I learned when I was uh, at Stratcom and I got with the NC3. I came out to see you guys. I went up to Seattle. I went out to Cambridge and I, I just wanted to see the industry that was out there because I, I was trained as a software or educated as a software engineer, but that's like a different, I mean, we didn't even have a computer science degree when I went to college. So, I mean, that's how old it is. Uh, but, you know, so when I was looking at um, how, uh, 
how they structure themselves and how they do work. The language was so different than the uh, the language I was used to. It is uh, it is a completely different structure, a completely way of doing business, and if they they can't understand how you could ever survive. I I, I told them the story of a a nuclear planning and execution system where I waited years for my next software drop. <laughs> years for the next software drop. They can't, you know, they would be out of business in a heartbeat if they can't figure out how to move it quickly. And the other thing that was s- stunning to me is that some of the hardest decisions a commander has to make or a service has to make, uh, depending on, on where it is, is when to move from one software version to another. Uh, because when you move from one software version to the new one, you can't go back. And you got to make sure that it works. And so because you got to make sure that it's work, you have all of this time and effort and unbelievable testing rigor that has to be done to make sure everything is right. And then I'm sitting there in a commercial company that will remain unnamed. And they they basically go through an automated testing process to make sure everything is right. Then they drop the version right into the operational system. And if they have a problem, they basically euphemistically flip a switch and go back. And the customer never sees any of it. That's the way the commercial sector is right now. That's the way we need to be. But we're still in the place where we have to test the heck out of it. Because when we move that, that version control, we can't go back. we got to get into the commercial sector. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, in uh, five or six minutes, uh, I'm going to open it up to those of you who are logged into Zoom to ask uh, your questions. So uh, you can submit those questions using the Q&A function, or if you're dialing in or watching via live stream, you can send those questions to info at piu.mil. But before I uh, I give up my time, uh, you mentioned the Jake. Uh, Jake is a very important partner for DIU. In fact, it's uh, great to see that there are a number of organizations around DOD that are focused on innovation, moving more rapidly. But one of the questions that comes up sometimes as we talk with uh, commercial companies and their investors is there's some confusion about uh, the different roles of some of these organizations. So uh, the question is, do you think we should be doing more to coordinate across uh, the different organizations that have been formed primarily in the last few years? And if so, how, how do you think we should go about doing that? So I, I think um, uh, we just, you know, from a roles and responsibilities perspective, it's simple. Um, and, and I'll explain why it's simple. From a implementation um, challenge, it's very difficult. So the roles and responsibilities, you know, Congress, once again, weighed in a couple of years ago because we couldn't solve that problem for ourselves. Uh, and so Congress mandated the separation of research and engineering from acquisition technology and logistics. And so we ended up with two elements, ANS and R&E, acquisition sustainment and research and engineering, mandated by the Congress. And R&E is the focal point. All you have to do is go read the law. The law basically says R&E is supposed to perform the function that you just described. Uh, And uh, we've started down that path. Uh, That's where it, it all comes together. It's it's many ways a, a manifestation of the old ddr and the Deputy Director for Research and Engineering that used to be back uh, in the 60s and 70s, Dr. Johnny Foster, who went to Livermore, he was ddr and That's the structure where if you wanted to, the, to know exactly what was going on in future research and application, you went to ddr and That's the way Congress structured it. Now, that's what r and is, is working towards doing. Uh, the reason it's so difficult is because that is a completely different way of doing business, and that's not the way we've done business in the department for the last 20 years. And old habits are hard to break, which means each service has a different research element, and each joint element has a research element. MDA has a research element, uh, the Jake, but they're all supposed to be under research and engineering. So it's important as a department that we start putting discipline in that process. And uh, if industry needs a question, they should be able to go to, to either the director of research and engineering, the undersecretary, or uh, somebody that works for him uh, to get that uh, answer. That's the way the process is supposed to work. Uh, but it's going to be it's going to be a while before it's fully matures. Uh, so, if you got a question, 
you know, people can ask me, I will force you in the put you in the right place. Uh, but the first thing I'm going to do is that there's somebody in our need that's supposed to be doing that. So I'm going to direct you there. Uh, but I'm trying to reach out and make sure I understand where the research is happening in the department. Cause I really am trying to focus my attention on the year 2030 versus the hour 2030. <laughs> Good. And we need you to be doing that. Uh, Maybe last question for me. Uh, are there technology areas that you think we're not investing in enough today? Uh, maybe some areas that we haven't talked about already with thinking about future needs. I'll just mention that uh, one of the ideas that uh, DIU has had is that there's not enough investment in hardware, future of hardware vendors. So we've pioneered this concept, national security innovation capital, to be a a catalyst for private investment in dual use hardware because we see the need for suppliers in the future that are doing more batteries or quantum sensors or space components, et cetera. So um, again, it's an infinite question. You've asked a bunch of <laughs> infinite questions. <laughs> so I'll, I'll try to pick uh, two examples uh, to give on where we could go. Um, uh, number one, uh, you mentioned it real briefly, at least one word is that we should be significantly investing, I believe, in, in quantum technologies. Um, because I think quantum technologies will eventually change everything that we do as a Department of Defense, everything that we do as a, a United States military. And, and I actually have, have no idea when quantum technology is really going to mature, um, because there's so many unknowns. I mean, I... Um, uh, I, I had a chief scientist when I was at Air Force Space Command that um, sat down with me and spent most of a day just getting me to a point where I could understand the basics of the theory of quantum technology. And it was difficult for me to understand. Uh, and so I don't know when it's going to mature to a level that will make a difference. But I know that the, the place that does reach that point first is going to have a significant advantage over the rest of the world. And therefore, it better be us. And we and, and we are investing in it, but I, I don't think nearly enough. And we need to I think we need to step up and and add that into the, uh, the the level that we're investing in artificial intelligence and other places to make sure that we understand really what's going on. I, again, most of that's going to come out of the commercial sector or the uh, or the uh, educational sector because that's where the most of the research is going on there. Uh, but we have to make sure that we, as a military, understand what that is and are moving forward. I think we have been challenged there because it is just so hard to understand what quantum technology is and how it changes encryption and how it changes computing and how it changes everything that we do. Uh, but we need to uh, we need to walk down through that as we go. We are investing enormously in hypersonics, which is good. Mm -hmm. um, that's a, that's an important area that will be critical. It's also interesting to note that our hypersonic program is focused on our conventional capabilities. Uh, our competitor's hypersonic program is focused on conventional and nuclear capabilities. That should worry everybody on the screen. So we need to understand that, which means that we have to also invest in ubiquitous sensing capabilities that have the ability to see these kind of threats. And to see these kind of threats, uh, you can't see them very well from geosynchronous orbit. You have to be lower, uh, whether that's distributed uh, LEO, uh, which I think has huge potential, or a, a medium Earth orbit. Uh, I think the, the the decisions out on that, but we have to be investing in the technology maturation to understand the sensor technology that allow us to do that. Because if you can't see it, you can't deter it, and if you can't see it, you can't defeat it. Goal number one is to deter. Goal number two is to defeat if deterrence fails but you have to be able to see it to be successful on both sides. So I'll just, I'll stop there. Well, it's an, it's an area you and I've talked a little bit about is uh, the importance of uh, commercial technology to have proliferation of satellites and commercial imagery. And we're now on the verge of, of seeing that happen. That's been an idea for many years, but now we're, we're really on the cusp of seeing it. So well, let's take, a, did you want to add anything to that? Oh, go ahead. We'll take some questions. Uh, from Let's take a couple of questions. Uh, first of all, uh, from uh, Army Captain Scott Gorman. To compete with adversaries like China, who benefit from strongly and relatively seamless cooperation between government and private industry, how can the U.S. bridge the cultural divide that exists between the military and the commercial sector? 
So we, we did it in the Cold War. Uh, you know, the Soviet Union had a quote unquote uh, streamlined decision process. You just had to uh, get to the chairman of the party, right? And uh, all decisions could be made quickly. Um, look, you know, pick any example you want from the Cold War. Uh, the race to the moon, uh, we won. Um, they Almost every significant race we won because we moved faster than the adversary. Uh, if we did it in the 60s, how come we can't do it um, 60 years later? There's no reason except our hesitancy about authorizing people to take risk and then holding them accountable for delivering the capabilities. You know, when I say you got to delegate risk, that's just not, you know, here are the taxpayers hard earned dollars, just do whatever you want with them. You're going to be held accountable and you're going to have to deliver. But boy, I think everybody that wears a uniform wants that authority thrust on them and says, just go do great things for the nation. But if you fail, you will be held accountable. And that's okay. Uh, but we have to get back to that. So for an Army captain, uh, I'll just tell you, as an Air Force captain, uh, in, the, in the development and acquisition business in SDI, I, as a captain, had a $60 million a year budget with full authority to move things around on that $60 million. I was the deputy for engineering for SDIO, and I had a $60 million budget. Uh, and oh, by the way, if I screwed up, believe me, uh, I would not have been around very long. Uh, but that was okay with me. Uh, I didn't expect to be around long anyway, to be honest with you, but, uh, but that was okay. Uh, but we just don't give that kind of authorities to uh, uh, even program directors very much anymore. Can you imagine having a $60 million a year budget that you can move money in and out of depending on where you wanted to go? <laughs> Holy cow. And that's a captain in 1989. That's just a totally different world than we live in right now. We have to go back to that because if we do, then our our ability to go fast, I think, is hugely faster than uh, a potential adversary like China. Yeah, I, I'd like to add that uh, to the cultural divide, we're not seeing any uh, slowdown in the number of companies that want to work with EIU and want to work with the military. So while uh, Google Project Maven was so widely covered, we're finding that the exception. Uh, many more companies want to work with us than, than last year, and we think that's a great thing. Uh, question from uh, Aaron Mehta at Defense News. Uh, General, uh, you're talking about the tsunami of data that DOD officials have been saying is a problem for nearly a decade. Given all the offices working on it, including DIU, how close is the Pentagon to actually having a solution? Five years, 10 years, and how do you work that timeline estimate into designing future warfighting concepts? So uh, the, our, our belief is we have to be there by 2030. So for Aaron, the answer is 10 years. And if I was smart, I'd probably just stop there and say, Aaron, is 10 years. <laughs> um, but uh, let, me just, uh, let me just go a little bit further because we're going to try to get there uh, in a different way. And this is um, the change to the JROC that uh, the chairman is, uh, is pushing, I'm pushing. Uh, the Secretary of Defense is uh, is supporting, um, and that is we're trying to actually make the JROC uh, do what the JROC was intended to do in the 90s when it was created, uh, and that is drive joint requirements down to the services. For the most part, the way the JROC, the Joint Requirements Oversight Council that uh, that I chair, the way that process has worked is um, a Service develops a capability. It comes up through the uh, various coordination boards in the in the JROC, eventually getting to the JROC where we validate a service concept and make sure it, it meets the joint interoperability requirements. That's kind of the way the JROC is formed. But what was intended is the JROC would develop joint requirements and push those out to the services and tell the services, you have to meet those joint requirements. One of the ways we're gonna do that is we're gonna write requirements joint requirements for joint all domain command and control for um, for a joint contested logistics for joint fires. We're going to write those requirements and push those out to the services and then manage the services to meet those. We're going to have requirements for data, requirements for software, requirements, and we're going to push those out. But they're not going to be the traditional requirements that you look 
that you've looked at for years and capability description documents and capability production documents, they're going to be capabilities and attributes that programs have to have. And if you don't meet these, you don't meet the joint requirements and therefore you don't get through the gate and you don't get money. That's how we're going to hold it. And data is going to be one of those things. That's going to be one of the hardest things we have to write. But I've committed to the secretary that after the joint warfighting concept is published, ideally in, in December, shortly after that, we will begin publishing these joint requirements out to the services and what will be for data. That will allow us to manage it from the top level from a capabilities and attributes perspective, not from a, um, these are the data standards that you have to meet. These are the data formats you have to meet. Uh, if you work with the commercial sector, that is a losing strategy. You will never get there from here. And the commercial sector has tossed that away a decade ago. Mm -hmm. You have to get to, you have to know what the data is, how you characterize it, but that can be up to the developer. But we have to know how to access the data and what it looks like when we get there. But if you can do that, you can take that and you can put your own artificial, intel uh, artificial intelligence algorithms against it. Uh, all those things work. But one of the biggest challenges is going to be how do we define that in a way? And choosing the words is one of our biggest challenges right now. But we're committed to do that because I think that can help us achieve that 10-year requirement that Aaron asked about. Thank you. Here's a question from uh, our friend Jim Lewis at uh, CSIS. He's uh, trying to rival me with uh, the questions with infinite answers. His question, what's a good way to blast people out of Cold War thinking about technology and strategy? Um, so uh, two things. Uh, all Cold War thinking is not bad. Uh, <laughs> That's great. Because in the Cold War, uh, the, that was Schriever and Rickover. And Schriever developed an ICBM in five years, and Rickover developed a nuclear submarine in five years. From And they had to invent it. It's not like they said, okay, here's all your stuff. We know how to do it. Go build it, which we couldn't do today. They had to invent it and then build it. And Rick and Rickover built a, a nuclear submarine in five years, and, and Schriever did 800 three-stage solid rocket ICBMs in five years. So there's not all bad from the Cold War mentality. Uh, you know, it's, it's important to remember the good things that were there. And so to learn from the good and forget the bad is the challenge in anywhere. So I don't want you to think that there's things that can't be learned from the past and learned from the Cold War. What we have to do is we have to develop a different way to apply the technologies. Uh, because the technologies now, unlike back then, where Schriever had to develop basically a company that ended up being called TRW uh, that would figure out how to do that because there was no industry partner to do that. Now there are industry partners that are out there that do this stuff all, all the way. And, and we have to figure out how to leverage those capabilities that already exist and bring them in. So it's a different way of doing business, but not all things in the Cold War were bad. Great point. Some back to the future there. Uh, let's uh, finish up uh, on space. Uh, so from Jeffrey Treberman, you spent so much of your time in the space business, now being a step removed, I'd say you're not very far removed. How are you feeling about the progress being made in the national security space sector, both in government and industry and thoughts on critical challenges ahead? So thanks, Jeff. Um, I hope we run into each other again uh, if COVID ever ends. Uh, but, you know, the... It's a really an interesting question uh, that uh, we only have five minutes to the top of the hour and it, it basically would take an entire hour to answer that question. Uh, but so <laughs> this has been a series of infinite questions today, but you know, the, when you look at where we're going in national security space, some really exciting things have happened. The space command being the first, the space force being the second. And the space command aligned all of our operational Piece are under one commander who's going to spend every minute of every day worried about our nation's capabilities and advantages in space. That's critically important. That's probably the most important thing. But now we have a chief of space operations that has a space force that's going to be worried about building the capabilities for that commander uh, to achieve uh, the greatness that we think we can achieve in space as we go in the future. And once again, Congress did a very nice thing for us when they created the space force. And when the president signed the legislation, I think it was December 23rd last year, uh, I think that's the birthday of the Space Force, when, when Congress passed the budget and the uh, president signed it, 
they gave the Space Force uh, a wide latitude to define their future. They said, tell us how you want to do acquisition. Tell us how you want to do ops. Tell us how you want to organize. Tell us how you want to bring the other services in. Uh, tell us how you want to structure inside the Air Force. And, and the Space Force is going through that right now. And, and that's exciting. And, and that's, that's the right thing. Uh, but the other thing I point out all the time is that that's a finite period of time um, because it goes back to the answer I gave a while ago. Uh, Congress is an impatient body and, and Congress and the president work together to create the Space Force and they expect it to be done. They expect it to be done quickly and they expect all those answers to be on the table. And if they're not, what does Congress do? They'll write it for us. Uh, so this is where the Space Force uh, has to reach out and work effectively with the Congress uh, to make sure they answer all those questions effectively. Uh, if they do, that's the best way to go fast because uh, how many times have you been given the opportunity to find your own future? Uh, that's a pretty exciting time. And, and when you have to create a service out of whole cloth inside the United States Air Force, that's a pretty daunting challenge. But have that freedom of maneuver is a great thing. So Jeff, I think it's a pretty exciting time to be in national security space. Uh, we're moving things forward rapidly. Uh, I'm never happy with the pace that we have, and I won't be until I can be sure that we're ahead of any adversary that we might face in the world uh, as we look into the future. But we're in a good place right now. We just have to continue to accelerate the, uh, the flight path, to use an Air Force term for the Space Force. <laughs> That's great. Well, uh, thank you so much. We've come to the end of our time together. So I really want to thank you and your team for uh, helping us uh, have you here for this hour. Uh, this was one of our events to celebrate the first five years of DIU. We've got big expectations of hope for ourselves in the next five years, aiming to have even more high impact commercial solutions that uh, help the military and support your objectives. One of the things that uh, very important to DIU is to be completely aligned with where you want to take the department. So thank you again, uh, General Hyten. Uh, thank you to all of you who are listening uh, and the DIU team who made this event possible today. And a special thank you to all DOD and commercial partners that provide the service members with the best American technology available. Thank you all very much for joining us today. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, everybody. Bye now. Thank you. Out here.